but we're going to try to do our best this morning. I have some energy as we study Revelation and we study some things that are absolutely terrifying. As we think about Revelation and we go through our rules of interpretation, of course, uh, when we go through this, this is where it's going to get more and more sticky, especially beginning here in chapter 8 and even into 10 through 16. If the Every sign and symbol has to mean something to the intended audience. That's where we've talked about Republicans and Democrats with elephants and donkeys. We've talked about numbers, unlucky 13, lucky number 7. These are cultural ideas and norms that are understood by just about anyone who would pick it up. Does that mean we all agree with it? No. Does that mean we would all get it? Also, no. But for the most part, as a majority of society, it would be understood that way. Secondly, it cannot create conflict with other scripture, and it will keep with primary themes of Revelation. Again, we're going to start our class, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14. When in doubt, it comes down to this issue. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14, they will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. Those who are with them are called and chosen and faithful. That is the theme of Revelation. There is war. And it is on every plane. We've talked about it on earth. We've talked about the seven churches of Asia in chapters 2 and 3 that are struggling. And then there's the, the scene in heaven in chapters 4 and 5 where God is on the throne. And he's depicted in the most glorious way in his power and his magnificence. But there's also going to be in a war those who lose. There will be those obviously who are not with Christ. But in the meantime the question becomes, A, what is God doing about all the sin that's rampant? And B, why is he letting the good people suffer? And that's really what Revelation addresses. There is a war and Christ will win. But in the interim, where is God when all the good people are suffering? And again, point number one, what is God going to do about sin? Now, a lot of times we look at Revelation and we simplify it so far, once we get away from the fantastical, that we just say, okay, good wins, bad loses, God punishes sin, God's going to reward victors, sin happens. It's true. But we also need to see how God is going to progress. Notice how God deals with humanity who is sinful, but also humanity who is faithful. It's interesting, and it's not the way we would do it, and that's probably because we're not God. And so we need to try to learn about God from these chapters. So as we went through chapters 6 and 7 in particular, you have the loosing of the four seals. And remember, as John is taking in this vision, very important to remember that. John is watching this. We read it, and we, we read it and digest it, and we read a commentary about it, and then we go to class about it, and we hear a sermon about it, and we read a commentary about it, and we get scared about it. We read a best-selling novel from the New York Times about it. John is witnessing this revelation, this revelation that, by the way, is going to have words that the Christians in the first century were to obey, going back to chapter 1, things that must soon take place. That's found in chapter 1, chapter 4, chapter 22. And so when you, we see all these writers and we see the Christians who are crying out saying, God, how long until you avenge us? Imagine the impact this would have on John. And perhaps that can help us better understand the message of Revelation if we put ourselves into the role of John witnessing all of this, not just craziness, but all of the magnificence of God here. And so as we keep forward to chapter 6, it had to mean something to the people there. One of the main takeaways at the end of chapter 6 is that all the great ones of earth, the kings and the mighty men of war, the generals and all those who are wealthy, they're going to be hiding just alongside who? The lowest of society, the poor and the unlikely, in the day of God's wrath. That great question, who can stand in the day of God's wrath? It's going to be, of course, to our theme of Revelation, only those who are with the Lamb, only those who are with Jesus. And then we go into chapter 7, we see the 144,000 that will be sealed with God. Very important for today's lesson in the next few weeks. The 144,000 are sealed. Now, as we look at the first three verses of chapter 7, I do want someone to read this again. This is going to be important in today's class. Can someone please read chapter 7, verse 1 through 3? After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back to the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the So the thing that gets the press, of course, is that God sees his people. In the midst of a world that's about to be destroyed, God sees who his people are and he's going to seal them. Now this is going to be diametrically opposed to the mark of the beast later in Revelation. But God sees those who are struggling. He sees the people at Smyrna. He even sees the good people at Ephesus. And if there were any good ones at Laodicea, he sees them. And he's going to protect them. But one thing to remember, who's bringing the destruction in chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, that they're being spared from? Who is listening?
listed as the, the cause agent here? Who's going who's gonna to release the damage? It's, it's only the angels. It's either the angels or the people. And the, the Revelation teaches the people don't have control. We have one thing that we control, our actions and submission. Everything else is God. The picture of Revelation is there is a lot going on that we won't understand, don't understand, and are not in control of except our submission, will we choose the Lamb or not? Very important to see, Satan is not the only one bringing destruction in Revelation. God is going to do that. And of course, we know God only does that with a just purpose, but we'll get into more of that in today's lesson. Of course, as you look forward into verses 9 through 12 in particular, as opposed to the 144,000 specifically sealed, 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. You have this great multitude, and what is happening every picture of heaven we get? God is powerful, God is mighty, and what is every being doing around? Worshiping Every single time. The great news is in verse 9, the great multitude is from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. By the way, just a quick side note, Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 13, there's the narrow way that leads to life. I understand that God is the God of all humanity that's ever lived. But can we take a moment and just be thankful that there is a great multitude who is in heaven? These are people who made it. When we see that fifth seal, there are Christians crying out, how long till you avenge us? There are Christians who seem like they lost, and they made it. They have access to the throne. This is wonderful. This is amazing. And again, of course, the elders are there, and you see others pictured. And so you think about the difference in the 144,000 who are sealed versus all those great and powerful kings and generals. It's God's protecting them. We need to choose. Do we want all the protections this world offers? That will work for a long time until it doesn't. And when God comes, again, the question is asked, who can stand in the day of God's wrath? We come to chapter 8. Someone please read chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. In the land of the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Okay, so we've been tracking seals, and now we're coming to the seventh seal, which is the last, that perfect completed number. And now we're going to come to these angels. But before we do that, verse 1, remember, if we are John, and John's taking this in, the Lamb who is Christ, Open the seventh seal. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Okay, we're going to do something really awkward here. I have not usually done this in the past, so I've saved my bullets for this one. We are going to sit in silence for 30 seconds. Everyone breathe a sigh of relief. 30 seconds, just to, to have an idea. Plus or minus. I did have a timer there, so don't tell me my count was off. You can argue with Apple, not me. 30 seconds of silence is awkward, especially in a class like this. Imagine you're John taking in this great revelation. You've seen the throne. You've seen the angels. The destruction's about to come. But the Lamb finally came. All the good news was unraveled. And now there's silence in heaven for about half an hour. What impact would this silence have? What is the point of the 30 minutes of silence? It's got to mean something. Why 30 minutes of silence? Okay, first and foremost, it gets your attention. Now, in this case, it's awkward, right, for us. But for John, what an attention-grabbing statement. Of all that he could see, of all the magnificent stones and jewels that will be cited for heaven and all the throne of God and all the destruction that's spoken about, all the weird creatures that are going to be described, 30 minutes of silence would certainly grab his attention. Absolutely. What else would it say? It's grabbing your attention for something to come. Richard? Once again, God's complete control. Yeah. And God, the complete supremacy, that's a great word, that he demands. And we have to talk about sovereignty when it comes to will, but even that is being exercised here. Bill? Uh, everybody has their own views of what they see in this, but I, the image I get is one thing the city already mentioned. It, it's silence. It's silence. Yeah. It's silence. 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 It's silence.
sets the stage for what's about to come. It also represents a transition. Something's about to change. We've been describing previously the tumult on the earth and the persecution of saints and, and people saying, how long? This almost represents, I'm about to respond. Yes. And so you have about 30 seconds that would grab attention. It shows God's control. And it also, to use Bill's word there, it serves as a transition. Rebecca. Absolutely, right? It, we, we're not usually speechless with joy to, for too long. Usually we find a way to, to be happy with that, Jacob. Sometimes in public speaking order, you do something called a pregnant pause, and where you, you know, you stop and you give a pause and everybody kind of clues in and it really emphasizes what's going to be next. So I think this could be used as a pregnant pause. Absolutely. Uh, one just funny example of that. Can you imagine for the people streaming today, if they missed me say we're going to pause for 30 seconds? What might happen when their TV goes quiet? And I'm just staring down like this, and we're all just kind of looking down. That'd be weird. Do you, you think people might look up and turn their TV up to say, hey, what's going on here? There's something of note. Alan? I can't help but see the contrast between <clears throat> this 30 minutes of silence and then how verse 5 ends. Yeah, and this is really to Bill's point on that transition, right? And even to Rebecca's point on the ominous nature here. We are going to see God's power exerted. We're going to see basically every comment that's been made, you're going to start seeing as we transition so far in Revelation 1 through 7, it's basically bad stuff happens to good people. Good people need to be better, repent, and God's in control. But what does that mean? What does it look like? Here we go. In verse 2, then I saw the seven angels who stand before God and the seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer and was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And then look carefully at verse 4. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. The angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it on the earth. There were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. What are some of these scriptural callbacks? When you see all these descriptions, particularly in 4 and 5, what does this make us think of? Uh, hint, hint, Old Testament. What's drawn to mind through these descriptions? Well, the incense obviously ties directly back to the incense in the tabernacle later in the temple, which was commanded by God over the spring incense to be a part of the worship. Uh, and then even later, the New Testament, we, just, we see descriptions of things that are a, a pleasant odor to God, a fragrance to God, uh, even things that an odor that represents one thing to one Case of the incense here, the incense along with prayers are a call to God to respond. Yes. But it smells completely like something completely different to those who are about to be judged. Yes, and the way God takes this is in that pleasing aroma when you see how it's described in verse 3, prayers of all the saints. And it comes before God in verse 4 from the hand of an angel. Now, sometimes we make little points in Revelation and John makes points that we're like, okay, that's interesting, cool, God cares. And, and we, can, we can talk about that. But the other part of this is, in our study this morning, we're going to see a different kind of smoke emphasized. And it's very important to follow the images. Sometimes we just see the word smoke, and everywhere we assume in Revelation it's the same. We see the word war, and we assume everywhere it's the same. That's not true. This smoke is what kind of aroma? Is this a pleasing thing to God? Yes. This is about saints. This is coming before him. But we're going to see something different at the end of verse 5. Some of those Old Testament callbacks are the power of God. And what would God do when his power was challenged? He'd exercise it. He would prove his supremacy, and there would be carnage because of that. Now, that raises questions in the Old Testament, doesn't it? How, how could a just God kill? How could God do this or that? What is the answer to that question, at least on a very high level? We could talk for hours about that. But on a high level, when God struck people down, what is the re rationale that we can still worship a God like that? Besides the fact he's in control whether we like him or not. If he didn't do that, he wouldn't be. Okay, because of his just, his just nature and his holiness. His holiness and just nature demands to handle sin. That's what we're going to see in Revelation chapter 8 and 9. God's justice must be meted out. The question is how? What we would do when we're frustrated is just wipe everyone out. Can you imagine if you are at your worst moment of anger? You are on I-65. It has been 45 minutes. 
and you pass the wreck and you realize there is no wreck. Somebody's just sitting on the side of the road and we're all just watching. And you had the power to destroy humanity, what would you do? You would take out at least a good chunk of 65. Right? But God is more patient than we are, which is an amazing and wonderful thing. God gives us second chances, and when I say us, I mean people who don't even come close to even using the word deserve in a sentence. <coughs> about the second chance, as Gary rightly noted, Paul wrote about in Romans 5 today. So this is what we're going to see, and notice as we go some of the imagery here. So please read verses 6 through 11 right now, 6 through 11. Through verse 11. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters All right, so, so far, in these first three trumpets, uh, what kind of damage have we seen? What percentage damage and what has been damaged? A third. Okay, a third. What, what is the significance of a third? Why not just wipe it out? Why not half? What, what, is, what is the third? I was going to do, don't do the eye glazing thing here. What, what's the math here? Why a third? Why not half? Why not three quarters? Why not all? Why a third? This is not in the see limited uh, when you're collecting things or a limited series on TV. When you see an advertisement that says limited time, what are they trying to get you to do? Hurry and buy it, right? Because you're either creating false urgency by saying there's not a lot of it or, or we might run out. So you need to not only buy this product, but you need to buy it now before your good sense can kick in and keep you from wasting money on this. This is limited. It has a specific targeted purpose and focus. That's what you see here. But notice what is being destroyed. Well, in verse 7, hail and fire is thrown down, mixed with blood thrown upon the earth, and earth, grass, and trees were burned. In verse 8 and 9, the sea goes down. A third of the ships were destroyed. Verse 10, again, you see the third of the waters becoming bitter. And then, of course, verse 12, the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise, a third of the night. How bad would we say this destruction is? Especially when you consider, what's that? About 33%. Yeah, okay, yeah, about 33% damage. When you start including the sun, moon, and stars, though, this is cataclysmic. I don't care what third it is, I'm not... You know, an astrophysicist, but this doesn't strike me as a very healthy thing for the world. Constantly told if we were even just a tiny bit off of our axis, we would freeze or burn, and now we're just going to eliminate a third of the sun? First of all, can we see that this is not a literal idea for a million reasons? We're going to keep talking about that as we go through Revelation. Number two, what is the attention-getting part of verse 12 with this fourth trumpet blast? See it in the middle and the end there. Their light might be darkened, a third of the day might be kept from shining. What's the significance of darkness to basically anyone who's read a book ever? Right? What is light versus dark? It always means the same thing. What is the revelation of darkness conquering? Evil. Evil, bad, not good. The good is being calmed down. And what we want is bright light. 
but instead it's being muted. So it's angel. Everything is going down. We say a third, we say, well, it could be worse. Can you imagine if I said one third of Birmingham residents are going to be destroyed in one of the ways described by these four trumpet blares today? Would we say, okay, I feel pretty good about that. I got a two thirds chance of being all right. Some of you have five and six person families do not have good odds, but maybe if you're here you know, by yourself or with someone else, you say, okay, maybe I got a two thirds chance. We'd be terrified. This would be hor horrific. If we said you had a one in three chance, this would be terrifying. But then note verse 13. Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. I want to know, before we look at what could get worse, what do we know about God from the third? If God is angry with sin, name it Rome, name it personal sin, name it injustice, you call the sin that he's destroyed for whatever purpose. Why only a third? What do we learn about God from that? I'm not asking why he made a third, but what about God's characteristics do we understand about why he might only destroy a third? What does this teach us in the first century Christians about God? Number one sub-theme of Revelation. We know what the theme is, right? There'll be war with the Lamb, those who are with Him, called and chosen and faithful. Number one sub-theme. God is aware of everything that's happening. He's in control and He is aware. He's aware of good people doing good. He's aware of good people who should be repenting. Quote, unquote, good people who should be repenting. He's also aware of those who are doing evil. He sees it. He's got it. So the question is, will we trust his handling or not? And what do we learn about his handling? So, secondly, since we see God sees it, what do we learn about him for actually exacting what we, we might call vengeance or avengement on one third? What do we learn about God here? And how might this matter to Christians being persecuted in Rome or by Jewish leaders? This is not a complete destruction, right? <coughs> I think this is the, one of the largest keys of chapter 8 and 9. And you're actually going to see this. I've been trying to save it. Uh, but at the end of chapter 9, you're going to see that this is absolutely a call to repentance. Chapter 9, verse 20, the rest of mankind, there's a context here, obviously. But verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immoralities or their thefts. Whatever plagues are going on between, I do think chapter 8 and 9 are connected, but even if you separate them, God is desperately trying to get people to what? Repent. There's a difference between God and me, besides giving people lots of chances and, and, and everything else, is that when I'm upset on 65 or where, whatever is causing me harm, I would wipe it all out. God has control to be precise. God has self-control, we might call it, to provoke people to change. This is the purpose of Revelation. Sometimes we oversimplify again, good and evil, and God's just wiping out evil. God doesn't just wipe out evil. God forgives evil. Can we, can we acknowledge this fact? This is a wonderful thing that in chapter 8, it is only one-third. Why? Because that gives everyone in this room, starting with me, who is and has been evil, a chance to be redeemed. If God is the God who just wipes out sin the moment it happens, we're all not here. And even if we were here, we would be 1 Corinthians 15 without hope, because if God's just going to destroy us, he wouldn't have sent Jesus to die or be resurrected. This is an amazing fact about God, that he sees sin, he handles it, and still gives the exact people committing the atrocities a chance to repent. I don't like that all the time, unless I need it. And then I'm desperately thankful for it. As Christians in the first century, I might be asking myself, why is God letting Rome do this? Why is he letting the Jewish leaders do this? Why isn't God stopping it? 
And sometimes the answer is God's hoping that the very people doing the persecuting will change. And we don't think that's true. Look at the Old and New Testament, most importantly, Paul. Paul was one of the leading persecutors specifically and for the exact cause of Christianity. And what did God have with him? An entirely different purpose than we would have drafted. And, I, and praise be to God that he gives us that grace. This would be a very important note. But also to see, by the way, he is going to handle it. And what, what happens when they don't repent? Chapter 9, verse 20 and 21. I, I assure you, Revelation is going to cover that as well. Uh, I'm left with this question in verse 13, though. When this angel comes and says, whoa, three times, that this is going to get worse. <laughs> How could it get worse? We're not quite to the full, I, Revelation is going to get to the full destruction, so I know one-third means two-thirds left can be destroyed. I get that part. But what, what possibly could be coming without just a complete annihilation? What could be worse than destroying parts of the earth? Well, like we've seen in Revelation. <laughs> There's consequences. There's consequences to the destruction. There's consequences for the destroyed and for the remaining. Clark? The, what comes after. Right. There's something that comes after. It doesn't just end there. Yeah. And, and yeah, the second thing is, by the way, woe to you, this isn't done. And, and again, as we might say in Revelation here in chapter 8 and 9, things are just getting started. Someone please read chapter 9, uh, verses 1 through 4. 1 through 4 for this moment. So we see our smoke theme come back. Before we get further into this, though, let's ask the question, as we look at how bad this fifth trumpet is, we can see things are getting worse. Because this is just, ch chapter 8 is essentially what I'd call things we understand. The earth being destroyed, water becoming useless. We, we get that. It's a pain. It's horrific. But we, we understand it. This is getting completely out of hand here when you see, verse 2, open the shaft of the bottomless pit. The sun and the air were darkened with just the smoke. And then these horrific locusts come out with the power of scorpions. And we're going to talk more about them, of course. If you're a first century Christian, what are you doing with all of these trumpet blasts? What is your takeaway? Is this helpful, harmful, scary, happy, all of the above? What are you feeling as a first century Christian? What is the takeaway from John's revelation here? It's got to mean something to the original audience. Pretty scary. Okay, number one, this is frightening. And by the way, where is all the frightening coming from? Who is behind all of the frightening? In chapters 8 and 9, very important to see God is behind all of this. Sometimes we get really distracted because we see it back in chapter 8, verse 11, the name of the star is Wormwood that fell. And we do this weird thing where apparently that's Satan. I, don't, I think that's a bit of a stretch for a lot of reasons. But in chapter 9, we see the bottomless pit and we go and we start thinking, okay, this is scary. Here's Satan. And then there's God. And we forget who is behind the trumpet blast? Who is behind the seals? Who loosened the seals to give a chance for any of these to happen? God is behind them all, and Jesus loosed the seals. No matter what is happening, God is in power, and God is in control. And remember, what's our number one sub-theme? God knows what is happening. Does that mean God is making it all happen? No. To, to read any part of Scripture and conclude that God is persecuting Christians is not only a violation of passages like James chapter 1, that God tempts no one, but it's a violation of God's character. But to allow free will and all of its sinful repercussions to happen is within God's created and given framework from Genesis chapter 1. He made us in his image. And apparently, however that image meant, I think with the ability to rationalize right from wrong, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve both sinned. The beginning of creation when things were perfect, God's initial models, 1.0, they chose to sin. God allows sin without causing it. There is a delicate dance we need to be careful with here. But as we look at chapter 9, we see things are getting worse. So someone please read verse 5 and 6. What are these locusts doing in verse 5 and 6? They're attacking the evil people. Yes, they are. Judges of the Lord against those who were wicked. 
And we look at the plagues of Egypt, right? We'll go ahead and get into that right now. Those were judgments on not only Pharaoh for saying no and the people for oppressing God's people, but also the God they were going to. What were they putting first? What, were, what was Rome putting first? Sometimes Caesar, sometimes materialism. Revelation is going to dismantle those just like Egypt was. Verse 5 here, they were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. In those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Very important to track this. Where is the locust power from? Now, we understand God is behind everything. But specifically in chapter 9, as John is witnessing this, where is the power being derived from? Uh, so when I, what I mean by this, let me be clear. God gives us everything, but when I plug in a lamp, I could say God gave me the power for this lamp, but that's not what I mean. What I mean is the electricity in the house powers the lamp. Within God's created framework, maybe it's God, maybe it's not, where are the locusts driving their power from? What about the bottomless pit? Okay, the bottomless pit in verse 2. When it was open, the smoke came out, and the smoke from the pit was so severe that it darkened the earth. Then verse 3, from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions on the earth. Now, despite all this power, and despite the fact this does not seem to be what we'd call God's you know, kindness here, what are they limited by? They can't harm those who have the seal of God on their forehead. Going back to chapter 7 and verse 4, they can't, excuse me, verse 3, they cannot harm those who have the seal of God. God sees who his people are. They will make war on the Lamb, and those who are with them are called, chosen, and faithful. Called and chosen for what? To be spared. To be spared from the judgment to come. How? Why? They are faithful to the Lamb that brings such a victory. And so, why was the power even given? As we look down in verse 11, they have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek his name is Apollyon. Why are these locusts out? You read Revelation sometimes, you're like, what is happening? Why? It looks like a part of phase one or phase two of, of God's judgment having so. If the reader compares what is said about the saints, some of whom were killed, but now look where they are. They're in heaven praising God. Look at the fate of these people by comparison. They would be begging to die. Their fate's worse than that. Yes. And, and those who oppose God, this is the, this is the scripture. And that, that's sufficient. The, the picture being horrendous and me saying I don't want to be there is the point. It is the takeaway. Second time we've seen this in verse 6. In those days people will seek death and will not find it. This is God's judgment. First time we saw God's judgment. Who can stand in the day of wrath? What are the kings and generals of the earth doing? Back at the end of chapter 6. What are they doing to hide from the wrath? Hint, they're not hiding, but they're trying. Where are they? They would rather the mountains fall in chapter 6 in verse, at the end of verse 15. They hid themselves in caves and among the rocks and the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne from the wrath of the land. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Again, I mentioned this quickly in passing. There is a popular interpretation. Don't know if I accept that or not. But that what they are calling for is they would rather deal with the earthquake and mountain breaking down on top of them then deal with the wrath of God if they had to choose. And again here, those who are being judged, in, in this case of the judgment from the scorpions, they will seek death. Now, you don't have time to go through all this. Revelation is an incredibly dense book. There's a lot historically to track here, I think especially with the dating of it in Rome. One of the things you see is God will use evil. He will use and harness evil and turn it on where? Itself. 
If you want to be evil, fine, so be it. Turn on themselves. This is you see this in the Old Testament all the time. The Israelites would sin, and they would walk themselves into a corner to go up against a bigger, badder enemy, and what would happen? <clears throat> they would lose. He said, okay, if you want to fight without me, great. You're not going to win, but so be it. If you want to be selfish and prideful, go for it. What I think you actually see as you study Rome historically is a lot of what they did to fall as a civilization and fall pride and the, king, the kingdom, as we might call it, imploding on itself. It's not really our, our focus here, but I do think this is part of the takeaway of chapter 9. But how would verse 4 and 5 be an encouragement to first century Christians or even us today? The idea that this is so horrendous, so terrible, and, everyone, and people will be tormented, but in verse 4, not those with the seal of God. Where is the encouragement here? I think beyond just asking why would we be encouraged, I think that's a very easy question, is do we talk about this protection? Do I really believe, am I persuaded that God protects Christians? Because I read in chapter 2, the church of Smyrna is going to be persecuted for 10 days. And God tells them, be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Do we talk about God protecting us? This is the message of Revelation. Why not? Yes. And this would be the encouragement, but if you have gotten the seal, I don't have to care. I don't have to worry what's going on around me, because what am I living for? In Revelation 2 and 3, every single church, whether their persecution was done, whether the church of Philadelphia would be spared entirely, or they were in sin and needed to repent, live for the judgment. God will be with you. Rebecca, then back to Clark. chapter 6 and that fifth seal when the Christians are calling out Lord how long till you avenge us we would say basically he said no <laughs> it's going to be a while he, he said no to their prayer of avenge us now essentially now what we see is sometimes God does take action God serves in a, in a multiplicity of ways and we don't know when or why he's going to choose what but we need to know that he's there and that he is in control and he's making the wisest action Clark Yes, there, there's nothing better than not only having this conquer, conquering victory of Revelation 17, but of knowing there is true protection, that we don't have to worry or be bothered by what's going around. Let's read a little bit more about the locusts here. Someone read verse 7 through 11. Verses 7 through 11. we've seen five months, by the way. Again, calling back to Revelation 2, the church of Smyrna would face persecution or tribulation for ten days. We call that a complete time. Whether you use the perfect number seven or ten as complete, what is five? An incomplete rendering. Right? Whether you use five out of seven, it's a lot, but not all of it, or even a halfway point. Their power was limited, but their power was also mighty. What are we learning from their description of the locusts? Horrific creatures, all right, and that, that probably was uh, taken uh, well, a uh, point well taken from verse 2. When they came out of the bottomless pit, this isn't going to be pleasant, but this is a frightening creature. 
What are we learning from their appearances? Yes, it'd be very difficult to defeat. In fact, it, there's really no reading of chapter 9 that says man could destroy them. They actually are just going to kind of go until their power has been limited. And good news is we've already seen God limiting their power in a couple ways. But absolutely, because, especially when you look at verse 9, their breastplates were like breastplates of iron. They would not have that weakness. They were not exposed in any way. Uh, we see in verse 7, their faces were like human faces, perhaps wisdom. Their hair like a woman's hair, perhaps an appeal of a person character-wise. Their teeth like lion's teeth, the power and the, the just absolute destruction that would be caused from that. And of course, even the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. Even their tails were strong and powerful. Every component of this beast is made to be ferocious, terrifying, and effective. And the least of which should get our attention is actually the most important point in verse 11. Who's king over the locusts? The angel of the pit. And we're going to talk a lot more about the forces of evil as we get into chapter, especially 11, 12, and 13. But we'll move on for now to see that this is a powerful, fearsome, dreaded creature. Someone please read verses 10 through 18. 10 through 18. did the 30 seconds of silence thing, guys. Yes, uh, verse, verses 10 uh, through 18 again. Sorry. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> it's still chapter 9? Yes. Okay. They had tails and stink lips full of ants, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tail. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name is Okay, so in verse 10 and 11, you have the scorpions whose tails sting, and their king is the angel of the bottomless pit. And then verse 12 comes out and goes, okay, that was just woe number one. <laughs> now woe number two. And what do we see here in the second one? What are the angels up to here? Yeah, this is, we've transitioned mostly from the locust. It's now in verse 15. They've been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year. Were released to kill a third of mankind. Now, the angels were released to kill a third of mankind. They are not from the bottomless pit. Who is empowering the angels to wipe out a third of life? God is. This is very clear when we go back to Revelation chapter 7. There's a lot of quibbles about this, and we try to be inconsistent. In chapter 7, verse 1 through 3, as we read to start class, the angels are there. They are holding back the destructive wind, the destructive forces. And who intervenes? Okay, a messenger of God saying, you've got to mark God's servants first. The marking has happened. And now they are being told, let it go. And when they do, this is bad. Verse 16, the number of mounted troops were 200 million. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision. They were breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and sulfur, the heads of the horses like lion's heads. And again, plagues. You see that word plagues. And you see fire, smoke, and sulfur coming from their mouth. We've seen fire, smoke, and sulfur multiple times in the chapter. Sometimes it's in that pleasing aroma before God at the beginning of chapter 8. Sometimes it's to do with the scary locust and the angel of the bottomless pit in chapter 9. Either way, smoke and sulfur is showing us that there is a great deal of power in what is occurring. And by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. 
And again, now we're left asking, why is God allowing angels to kill a third of mankind? Quibble with who Abaddon is, if you will. Be terrified by the locusts, sure. Know that they came from the bottomless pit, of course. This one is very clear. The second woe of the three is really bad, and God is behind it. Why is God doing it? Sin. Sin is why God is doing this. I mean, we look at Revelation and we, we make this book really complicated. And really what this comes down to is God will not stand for sin. The Christians are calling out, why are you not doing something about it? And here's the answer. God in action is saying, I am doing something about it. But what was the caveat going back to the fifth seal? The number of martyred Christians is not yet complete. It would become complete at one point. God has the full picture. One of the things we take away is God is in control, and that's not always just a positive thing. That should be a frightening thing if we're not with God. On the other hand, as Clark made mention of before, it should be a tremendous blessing and something we talk about, that if we are God's called, chosen, and faithful, we can have faith that this is a God we want to judge the earth. When we read the Psalms, it's very uncomfortable when David is constantly, and even sometimes Nehemiah and others in the Old Testament are constantly saying, God, judge my enemies. God, if I have done any wrong, you judge me. How many of us are bold enough to say that? But if we know that God is in control, and that God is going to punish those who are wicked, we could say that. We could pray that. That would be real. And it would be a show of our trust and faith in God's plan. God is going to punish mankind because mankind is guilty of sin. The question is, will I be on the guilty side or be with the lamb who is redeeming? Not the perfect side, the redeemed side. There's a difference in scripture. And so as we look at this next component, we say, well, why was the group that was killed, killed? <laughs> Verse 19, for the power of the horses is in their mouth and their tails, for their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. This group that was killed, we know from the locusts some were protected. Who was not killed? That might be the quickest way to get to this. Who was not in the number killed? A bunch of people that had been alone. God's protected. This is not going to be the case through all revelation, but right here it is. This helps us with the complexity. Where is God when I hurt? Where is God when sin seems to conquer? Sometimes God's right there punishing sin, and I happen to live in where Satan's throne is. I live in modern-day Babylon. I live in first-century Rome. Sometimes there is a penalty for sin in being around sin. Sometimes those dominoes fall and hit others. The good news is, what did God do with Christians who were martyred? Martyred means killed for their faith. <laughs> that was not fair or just by any definition, but what did God do with them? In Revelation, where are they? They're before God's throne. They have access to him. That is amazing. The takeaway from Revelation is, just like it is with the rest of the scripture, God is in control, God is all-powerful, but sometimes God's not going to do it the way I think he should. But here is one of the powerful moments where we can say God is not only punishing sin, he is sparing the righteous. Isn't that comforting? Whether in a temporary or long-term way, God will take care. We saw this preview in Revelation chapter 2. I'm saying it over and over to help us build those connections. Church at Smyrna had nothing wrong said about them. And yet they were going to be tried and go through tribulation for a complete time, 10 days. Church of Philadelphia in chapter 3 had nothing wrong with it. And God said, I will spare you from the tribulation and the trials to come. That's not fair to my eyes and ears, but it's part of God's plan. Sometimes there will be a complete sparing, sometimes there will not. God is just. Rebecca. It goes back to the same false assumption that Job's friends had. Yes. Right? If something bad happens to you, you must be lazy. Yes. And I think Job... <laughs> Sometimes you're righteous and you just suffer, as an example. Sometimes you suffer, as you said, because you get caught up in the judgment of all the bad people who are around you. Yes. And, and really, Job is great, too. And I think Jacob on Wednesday night made mention of we get glimpses into heaven. One of the things Revelation teaches us is there's way more to the picture of life than we think about. I like Habakkuk because he calls out to God, hey, why are you letting guilty people punish you know, Judah? Why are you letting the bad people in Judah win? Why aren't you punishing us? And he gets mad about Babylon. He's like, well, they're worse than us. <laughs> Revelation shows it's not just about comparative evil among mankind. There's a supernatural battle. There are angels. There's a pit. There's the demon. There's the Satan. And then there's God and his angels. There is a whole lot to the picture that we can't even fathom. And so I think one biblical point, and we hate this, is the phrase, stay in your lane. Sometimes we just need to stay in our lane. My lane is praise God. My lane is do what God says, trust him. 
not have all the answers, not figure out all the whys. I'm not qualified, nor will I ever be, to have that level of omniscience that God has. Now, if God wants to give that to me, wonderful. But until then, I need to just simply serve God. Then I want to conclude with the, <laughs> the saddest verses, perhaps, in Scripture. Someone please read verse 20 and 21. We read it earlier, but please read 20 and 21. The rest of mankind who were not killed by this plague did not repent by the works, <clears throat> repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. The reason I put these verses among the most tragic in the scripture is not just that people don't repent. That's horrible. That's all throughout the scripture. We've seen that over and over again. It is God has warned them. Chapter 8, 9, one-third, one-third, one-third. Why? It is a warning. It is a heavy price, but it is a warning shot. Please stop sin. Please trust me. And what did the people do anyway? They kept on sinning. So God is going to respond to those who continue to keep on doing the wrong things. The good news is, and we want to end on a positive, God saw his people, he's guarding them, and that is a blessing as a Christian. We need to talk about God's protection. We need to talk about God being in control, that he cares about his people, he knows his by name. That should bring great comfort. We're going to move on to chapter 10, 11, and possibly 12.